Good morning, everybody. Um, don't be anxious. I don't have flowers or surprises. Just a regular information to you for this morning. Um, uh, the former speaker, Rein van der Kluyt, told you something about the broadness of the field of water management in which you're um, first year students. And it's a big theme, uh, water management. It's very, very big, a lot of um, specialties within it. And for this presentation I gave to you, um, I will focus on the storm surge barriers, and more in particular the uh, technical part of it, maintenance and operations. And I hope to give you some insight of the evaluation of the development of the storm surge barriers and the maintenance and operations within it. Um, the reason I'm standing here at this moment, I work in the field of the storm surge barriers within Rijkswaterstaat for the last 10 years. I was manager of the uh, storm surge barriers in the Rotterdam region. So that means the Maesland barrier, the Hartsel barrier, Holland's IJssel barrier and the Hangvlitz Sluices. Um, at this moment, senior advisor for the national and international context of Rijkswaterstaat for storm surge barriers. And I'm still operating in the operational team, so I'm one of the leaders of the operational team of the Maesland barrier. So Christian knew, knew that if today we would have a big storm northwestern, I wouldn't be here because I would be sitting on the Maesland barrier to close it. But uh, we do have southwest winds and it's uh, okay today, so that's why I'm standing here. And last but not least, I'm one of the founders of the international network iStorm. And I will tell you something about the international context in which Rex Wadersat is cooperating. But to help you with the field of this uh, maintenance operations, I first want to tell you a little bit of the historical perspective. Uh, you will see a lot about it here today. Um, I just stressed the most important parts. Then something about the challenge of the maintenance and operations. Uh, I will tell you something about the iStorm network and also specifically of the peer review and close up with the value of maintenance and operations. Here you see some pictures that most of you will have seen uh, earlier before. The 53 flat, um, Rein van der Kluyt, as the former speakers, already told something about the adaptation of the Netherlands and the Dutch people uh, centuries ago with living on mounds uh, in the Dutch Terpen. Um, and we had a way of living with the uh, uh, high waters from sea and rivers. Um, in the last centuries, we build, build a lot of dikes and dams, and we closed off uh, the sea from, uh, from the country, and we had a lot of place to live with. But always, we had some uncertainty if it would be fully safe or not, till 53, when we um, had the big floods within the southwestern part of the Netherlands. Not only Zealand, but also a big part of South Holland and the Rotterdam region was flooded too. Uh, and it was the decision made uh, to start off with the Delta Works. And we changed our way of uh, defending against the water from first um, having the uh, living on the mounds, later on building dikes and dams. And after 53, we started to building the uh, storm surge barriers, the movable storm surge barriers. And what was, I think, pretty important of the um, Delta plan and the Delta Works are the bottom two uh, issues, and that's the safety levels. Um, and the fact that the safety levels were stated in the Dutch Flood Defense Act. And might not be sound that interesting for you, uh, discussing an act, uh, a governmental act, but if you put it in the international perspective, and if you compare it to other countries, this is really something important, that in the Netherlands, um, we sometimes do have a lot of regulations. Uh, maybe sometimes we have too many regulations. But I think on this field, uh, for protecting people, to have those safety levels for certain reaches within the Netherlands, it's pretty important. Because um, we're all obliged, as companies, as a government, to work on those safety levels. And in relation to my presentation, it's pretty important because for our daily maintenance and daily operations on those storm surge barriers, we have to set and to level these safety levels. So we always have an aim, we always have a goal to have our barriers at a certain standard.
When we started the Delta plan and the Delta works, the first we wanted to do as the Netherlands was closing estuaries off from the sea to shorten our coastline with two thirds. Uh, so it's an, can e you can imagine it easily, just shorten your coastline and you would be more safe. But at a certain stage, when we started to build the barriers, in 58, the first storm surge barrier at Krimpen and the IJssel was built, um, and the last one in 2002. Actually, the 2002 Rams Bowl barrier, it's near Zwolle, and it's not really a part of the Delta plan, but it's the biggest and last uh, built storm surge barrier, movable storm surge barrier. Um, and what's important of that one is if you have a, a big northwestern storm on the IJssel lake, it will go flow into the IJssel, and we have to protect our uh, city of Camp Kampen, and that will be done by the big floatable barrier. You can see it on the right top end here. So these are the major storm surge barriers we do have in the Netherlands, with the Mason barrier top left, the Hartel barrier uh, middle, that's uh, near Spijkenisse, uh, the south part of Rotterdam. Then left below, of course, the Eastern Scheldt, closer to this area. Top right is the Ramspol barrier, near the place of uh, Zwolle. The middle right is the Hollandse IJssel barrier, between Capelle and Krimpen IJssel. It's the eastern part of the net, uh, from Rotterdam. And that's, that's interesting, because after the flooding in Zealand and the south part uh, the, the Rotterdam region, the first barrier we built was at the eastern part of Rotterdam. Due to the fact that when we have high levels and one of the dikes would break behind Rotterdam, the whole city of Rotterdam would flood from the eastern side. Um, and the last part on the right uh, button, it's the Heringfleet Sluices. It's still a Sluices complex, but in 2017, we will introduce the project De Kier. That means that we more often open uh, those gates and that Sluices complex will be a barrier as well. And then I think we come to an interesting point. Um, the environmental uh, pressure changes the final design of the Delta Works. As the first intention was to close off the estuaries, at the end we built some barriers um, that not really close off uh, the estuary, but are um, only used when needed. For example, the Maesland barrier, uh, the Hartel barrier, but also the Hangfleet, uh, the Ramspol barrier, are fully open. That means we have to close them off when there will be a storm. Um, and new therefore, new characteristics introduces higher complexity. You can imagine if you just have a dam, uh, you have to inspect it and you have to maintain it, but it's not that complicated. If you have huge movable constructions, uh, you use prediction, decision and control systems, um, and you also need high reliability and availability requirements. That means it sets a high standard on what you have to do to maintain those barriers daily and to be sure that they will function when needed. Um, the Water Act requires uh, a legal assessment, so that helps to be sure that everything will be operating and be uh, of good quali quality. Um, but in a way, it set new standards for maintenance, operations and organization. So what you see on those, all those centuries, first living on mounds, later on building dikes, finally building storm surge barriers, it's getting more complicated. It's, it's giving way to the river, it's giving more room for the water, but it's pretty complicated in the maintenance and operations. And therefore this next picture, on the left you see the Maesland barrier, on the right side you see the uh, Hartel barrier. And in a way there is a comparison between the Boeing 747 and I don't know if you all know the right photo. It's the sleeping, uh, sleeping giant in the Efteling, um, the fun park in the middle of the Netherlands. Um, and the comparison between these is the Maesland barrier and the Hartel barrier are pretty complicated and all those parts, components, uh, um, technical issues that are part of it that have to be sure that it will be operating. You can compare it with a Boeing 747. Um, only thing is, it's just sleeping, it's just laying there. For example, the Maesland barrier 
hasn't been used yet for a real storm. It has been used once in 2007. I was leader of the operational team and we lowered the levels to be sure that we could be closed once, to be sure and to show the world it will work when necessary. But in a way, it's still sleeping there. It's still lying there waiting for the real big storm where we're heading for. It's just like a Boeing 747, pretty complicated, standing there for 10, 15 years. And at a certain moment, you give a call to the airport, say in three days' time, the heads fly. Wondering, you are sure, it will not be flying if it's just standing there for 10, 15 years. So you have to keep that in mind. It's pretty complicated. It will not be used, but if it has to be used, you have to be sure, because the whole big part of the Netherlands is relying on it. And that gives us some challenges on the maintenance and operations. Those movable constructions, there are more interactions between the components. It's much, getting much more complicated than living on mounds or just building dikes and dams. It's high-tech technology. The maintenance regularly is not considered as sexy. I don't know how it's, if that counts for you, but when you're young, you're going to uh, university, and mostly you want to build new things, you want to discover new things. And it's even in our government and our politics. Everybody is more fancied about thinking about new things, opening and getting to build new things again. But it's pretty, pretty important to be sure it will be good operated and maintained. And it's not always in people's first interest to think about the maintenance and operations. And I hope to give you some food for thought today, to think about the interest it is to work on the field of maintenance and operations as well. The technical consistency, it's pretty important. You know some barrier, for the Mason barrier for example, but Eastern Shell barrier as well, they were developed for 100 years. So they have to work for 100 years at least. Um, but every reorganization in a big company or even in the government and also within Rijkswaterstaat is every five, seven years. And the political agenda may vary every four years. So we work in a context of a living organization and government that's changing constantly. But those barriers need the same thing every day. It's the con consciousness about maintenance and operations. Another interesting part is all those components that are within those barriers are fabricated and tested for continuous use. For example, if you know the Maceland barrier, there's are two big retaining walls, and within those retaining walls, we do have pumps. Those pumps were developed for sewerage. And a sewerage surrounding means constantly use and in a wet surrounding. Within the Maceland barrier, they're standing dry and they're standing still. So we as an organization, Rijkswaterstaat, has to develop testing program and techniques to be sure it will be maintained, it will be um, okay for operation when necessary. So it, 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 it asks from us to rethink about maintenance and operation, because when you ask a company what live, delivers those pumps or other constructions, they don't think about having those components standing still somewhere. No, the only thing about constantly use, for example, like in the Boeing 747. And last but not least, every barrier is a prototype. There's only one Eastern Shield in the world. There's only one Maceland barrier in the world. There's only one Ramspool barrier in the world. And there are sm small comparisons between barriers in the world, but they're all prototypes. So there's no one-on-one -on -one comparison. You can't learn exactly everything from another barrier. There are similarities, but you have to develop them yourself. And there's knowledge scarcity on individual elements and total structure. I mean, it, it's, it's the combination of all those components in such a barrier that makes it that barrier. And that knowledge bridge cars. That gives us a big challenge on knowledge management. And that problem, this is introduction to give you a thought about the importance of the maintenance operations of those storm surge barriers and through the decades and centuries how we developed towards the complexity of storm surge barriers, the movable barriers. Um, and in 2005 when I started as uh, 
a manager of the operational team and of the people working on those barriers. We had a big reorganization in the Rijkswaterstaat organization as well. And we had a two, two aims. One aim was the organization should get smaller, so less people, we should do more work. And the other was we should have more work done by companies. So a lot of knowledge went to companies and we didn't have all the knowledge within our organization ourselves. But as you see, we have a pretty important task to keep up a certain level of standard of knowledge to be able to operate and maintain those storm surge barriers. And during that period, I was thinking, how should we do that? And we started two things. One was a community of practice within the Netherlands of all those managers and people working on storm surge barriers. So we combined the interest and the people on the Eastern Shell, the Maesland, Ramspol, and have two, three times a year that they visit each other and learn from each other. And secondly, I was lucky that I could join with a, um, a traveling from my, the highest boss of Rijkswaterstaat, Bert Keitz, he was director general, to London. And London is the Thames barrier, and I could join him to a trip over there. And I met my colleague at the Thames Barrier, Andy Batchelor. He was the manager of the Thames Barrier. And the Thames closes off the whole of the Thames uh, in, the, in the UK. And we had a pretty interesting evening. We liked each other, that helps. But secondly, we recognized so many things in each other. And drinking one Guinness, two Guinness, another Guinness, we had a whole evening just talking about our experiences, me on the Maesland barrier, he on the Thames barrier, there was a lot of recognition. Also, he had a, a tough job with a specific uh, structure as the Thames barrier, with a big organization, the Environment Agency, and his barrier didn't always fit in the procedures of his organization. And also, he was searching in a way how to work together with the industry, or to be sure that it would work and he had the right people. So all those ad issues we discussed that evening, we had something, we, we should work together. In a way, we should find each other because we understand each other. And actually that was the start of what later became the International Network of Storm Surge Barriers. We just started together and thinking of how could we cooperate internationally. And we discovered that together with the Thames Barrier and we went to St. Petersburg because St. Petersburg they were building a barrier, went to Venice, you will hear something later on Venice. They were building a barrier there, they're still building a barrier, it's in two years, um, it will be ready. But it was a starting point of an international organization, um, first only for managers, I will tell you something about the evaluation of the network, but it started just with two people sitting, drinking a beer, uh, having a chat, and having a lot of recognition and respect for each other, and thinking we should combine our knowledge. And it brings us to the iStorm network that nowadays, after 10 years, has its aim really defined, and it's an international network that brings the storm surge barrier community of practice together, to seek the very best standards of operation, management and performance in order to reduce the risk of severe flooding to people, property and places around the world. And then in the five stages, I will tell you shortly about it, because 2005-07 we started, and it was just about the recognition with the Russians, with the Italians, with the English and with ourselves from Holland to getting to know each other, and exact building trust. It's not, it, you have to get to know each other to understand what each other's probability, possibilities are, um, to share knowledge, to learn from each other. And we started with annual conferences, but it was all just getting to know each other. Later on, 2007, 2009, it was less management, because as managers we interacted the first time, but we tried to get more uh, employees involved, uh, but we stick to the informal fun and pleasure. You have to get to know each other, you have to like to work together and to share knowledge. And that we slowly started with that for the first five years. Then we started to do field trips to get to know each other's field of uh, interest. 
And only in 2009, 2010, so five years after we started, we made the structure of the iStorm network. We made the name, because our first our name was the International Network for Storm Surge Barrier Managers. Now that's too long. So the iStorm with the iPad and the iMac and the iStorm is much better, I think. And we made the logo, we made the site. Um, and we started to be in contact with the WANO. I will tell you a little bit later on. But we were able to exchange really crucial and confidential issues. I remember a, a meeting with the Russians when they told us that they had real problems. They have a, a kind of like a Maislin barrier as well. And underneath the Maislin barrier, they have uh, a tunnel. And they were really anxious. What about if there is some extremist with a bomb and a truck driving under the, through the tunnel under the barrier and it will explode? How do we deal with that? And those issues we, issues we deal with as well, because we can learn from each other internationally, not only on the technical issues, but also on the environmental issues, on the um, um, cybersecurity issues, on the extremist issues. So that was interesting for us to share that knowledge. But you have to build on trust first to get to know each other. Two thousand twelve, thirteen were pretty interesting. So at that moment, uh, the Americans were working on the uh, storm surge barriers in the New Orleans region, and they joined iStorm as well. The Americans do have storm surge barriers in Boston area, and they do have them now at the New Orleans area. Uh, Germany does have the Amsberg, and they joined as well, and the Belgians are building a new barrier at Newport. And that was the moment that we as an iStorm network opened for other members as well. Uh, contractors are joining now sometimes, um, other networks, and most interesting, I think, countries that are interested in building barriers. And I think that's a crucial one. Because what we see a lot of times in the world is that we're pretty good in developing and building, but we hardly ever think about the maintenance operations. So there are many barriers built in the world, or structures built in the world, that are pretty fancy and really good thought of that it looks good. But then you have to operate it. You discover all kind of, let's say, inefficiencies. Uh, and that's where we can, as an international network, help every country in the world build barriers to give them advice on the maintenance and operations. We'll tell you shortly about New Orleans about that. And the last step, this is where we are now. We stick on our success factors, so we see each other many times a year. So we do projects together, but we focus nowadays on really internationally cooperating with each other um, between government, contractors. And it gives you a photo like this, in which we can see we have annual conferences. We do peer reviews, I will tell you a little bit about it. We do have conference calls. Um, we work together with companies. We visited each other um, around the world. But if you see those pictures, I think the main common thing is it's about people. So people that work together, seeking for each other, and want to share knowledge. And that's really a bonding factor alongside the world. Technical people sharing knowledge want to work and cooperate with each other. And during those 10 years, especially in the last five years, we developed an ICE, a peer review. Um, and we did it with WANO. I don't know if you, anybody knows what the WANO is. The WANO is the International Network of Nuclear Power Plants. And after Chernobyl, about 25 years ago, all those power plants joined together and they said, we want to have anything like Chernobyl anymore. So they joined and they made the network and they developed a peer review. And the peer review for the WANO is one month a year, specialists all over the world join together on one nuclear power plant. They travel through the new power plant and they see everything as a colleague. They walk through, they see everything, they make notes of it, analyze it, and they learn from each other. And the, in, the WANO helped us as iStorm to develop a peer review, but only in 10 days. Because the people that work on storm surge barrier in the Netherlands, let's say about 100 people, you can't send uh, 10 or 20 of them uh, one month a year away abroad. So we have to make it uh, um, 
fitting for us. So we do develop the peer review. It's a 10-day instrument. I have a short film about it later on, in which you see that specialists from the US, Italy, Russia, um, England and the, and the Netherlands, joined for two, 10 days on a barrier, just walking through and learning from each other. And I think that the, the, the success lays in the fact that it's a review by colleagues. It's not an official inspection. It's just colleagues, if you have an official inspection, you won't tell them anything. If you have a, a, a colleague asking you something, you want to share. And it's just learning by looking, discussing, and anal analyzing, and that finally it it gives some best practices. So after those 10 years, walking, for example, at the Eastern Scheldt, everybody's learning something and brings it back abroad to its own barrier in Boston, New Orleans, London. And on the other hand, they see some areas for improvement in which, for example, the Eastern Scheldt barrier can learn from. On the other hand, it's making the world smaller. People discovering, I do have colleagues around the world. I can, all, I, can, I can call them, I can just ask a question, and it just helps to learn people, and so I have a problem, I can call my colleague in London, or Boston. It's not that difficult. And that way we're building um, communities of practice, and we did a lot of those reviews. For example, we did the reviews, physical reviews, on the Thames Barrier and Easter Scheldt and the Maceland, but we also do document reviews, and we went to the New Orleans barriers two years ago. And really, the Americans did a terrific job. After Katrina, you heard about Katrina early on in the movie, they had, it was devastating what happened to New Orleans. So they built all kinds of barriers around the city. In a five years time, they built all the structures and the barriers, everything that was needed to protect that city. But one did, they, thing they didn't do, they didn't think about the maintenance and operations. So when we came there, we got a question, can you check on our manuals if we're doing this correctly? And as an ice storm network with the specialists from the Netherlands, from Rijkswaterstaat as well, we looked at their barriers. And sometimes it was incredible because they, they had the same barriers as several locations in New Orleans, but with different components. So there was no comparison between the several barriers they used, so they had to develop maintenance programs separately for each barrier. They didn't think about the really the maintenance and operations of their own barriers. So pretty smart in what they did, really, in five years' time, building all those structures. But they do have a problem now, because in the maintenance and operations, they have to develop a lot of knowledge, and you have to um, think about how to make that efficient and to be sure that it will be workable. And the Americans are capable of a lot, but just thinking about the maintenance operations in early stages is crucial. What's interesting is for us now, if we look to nowadays, is that we started the peer review as an instrument to learn with each other, and at this moment, the peer review we developed as an instrument for Rijkswaterstaat and the iStorm organization, we're trying to develop now the peer review light. And the peer review light how it means that we knew, now will use it as an instrument to bring people in contact with each other. For example, with Rijkswaterstaat, to bring an electrical person from a sluice, from a bridge, from a tunnel, and from a um, storm surge bearer together in, for example, a sluice for two days, and they learn from each other. And it's a way of bringing people together with the same uh, field of knowledge, but sharing just normally they don't find each other. And you have to bring them together to really learn from each other. And I do have a little movie about it, uh, the Mount Maceland barrier we've done in 2014. And just an impression how it will work, I'll show you now a short movie. <clears throat> a short impression, we do have a movie of uh, 15 minutes, but I thought two or three minutes would be okay. It just gives an impression about um, what the peer review is, and it is two things way. It is actually learning from other experiences around the world to improve your own barrier, and secondly, to bring all those international con um, colleagues in contact with each other, so that they know they can rely on 
others in other places in the world. I had this one before. There we go. So after 10 years of ice storm, 10 years bringing international colleagues with each other, um, many new colleagues around the world, we discovered that, there, that they are there. Um, we collected new ideas, vision and experiences, and actually we get free advice um, and soundboard for experience. To give you some more practical ideas of what we did, for example, if you keep the um, mason barrier in mind. I don't know if anybody knows what the mainstream barrier, the two retaining walls. On top of the retaining wall, there's a local mobile. It's a red box under which the retaining wall is moving. And in that red box, we needed some special uh, parts to renew them. And our contractor in the Netherlands said, sorry, but we don't have those parts anymore. You have to redevelop your local mobile and those compartments, and you have to develop new parts so that we uh, can maintain them again. So it would be costly, about uh, 200,000 euros. Um, we called our contacts in the US and the UK, and our UK colleagues found those special parts that we were searching for, for about 10,000 euros. So you see, being in contact with your international colleagues saves us a lot of money. Uh, secondly, the information centers, for example. The Russians were building their barrier, and they wanted to buy, uh, build an uh, information center. Didn't have the knowledge about it, didn't know how to uh, start it up. They could learn from the English and the Dutch. Another one is very specific, the chlor chloride penetration. Can you imagine? You have those construction walls, uh, construction uh, um, in the, the middle of the sea, in the salt water, and due to the fact that it's getting warm water and cold water, they're getting little bursts in the concrete walls. At a certain moment, the chloride will intrude. We do have that problem in the Eastern Scheldt, we do it after the Haring Fleet Sluices, but the UK already has experience with it for two years, because we just can copy their results. And they're working with, for example, um, um, having a constantly temperature um, due to that fact, there is not the uh, intrusion anymore. So we can learn from them. It's not, we don't have to do our own research within the Netherlands. We can just copy the results from, from London. The same with the saw holes. We had some problems with the saw holes with the Eastern Shelf, but the Italians do have them too. So we can learn there from each other as well. Just practical issues that we have um, learned from each other the localization of the sensors. For example, the Hartzell barrier. It's a pretty complicated barrier with uh, uh, slides that um, go up and down. And we do have little sensors on it. And we have always problems with one or two sensors. Apparently, the Germans do have exactly the same system. And they had exactly the same problem as well. Only they solved it already. So we could copy their solution. It's just minor things, but to show you that there are solutions worldwide available, and you don't have to find it out your own way. Just travel abroad and learn from your colleagues. And the last two issues are pretty important, I think, the cyber security. Um, it's pretty new for us that we have to be cyber secure. Aren't, aren't there any possibilities for other people than, than we to interfere with our systems. And we have to be pretty sure about it. And lately, a lot of people are trying to um, interfere with those systems. And not really at the barriers at that moment. We have to be conscious about it. And it's, it's a field of interest in the water management as well. That at least something that we share knowledge about. But most of all, I think, uh, it's the recognition worldwide in the aim to professionalize on maintenance and operations. And that's something I would like to stress today um, for you all, that the maintenance operations of storm surge barriers, but all systems as well, that are technical uh, and helping us to cope with the water level, um, is an interesting field. And I can imagine this specialist, a specialism within the broad area of water management but pretty interesting nationally and internationally. If you look into the future, 
we see the sea level rise and it will continue. And at this moment, it appears to be accepted as a fact that we will have to cope with it. And the number of deltas, delta areas that have to cope with water uh, rise, sea level rise, will increase. So there will be more places in the world where they want to go um, building dams, dikes, but also storm surge barriers, the movable storm surge barriers. And specific field within the water management, I think, that's getting more and more interest the next decades. The Netherlands can keep um, its prominent role as a worldwide leader on the field of developing, building, maintaining. Um, however, I think it's pretty important uh, that we have to combine all those specialties. So not only the building and not only the technical part, but also the maintenance operations uh, and combine, combination of all those fields of interest. And there are two, I think, challenges. One is ISTOM can be an international community of practice. Nowadays already, you will hear a story this afternoon about Texas. And in Texas, they are starting building a barrier, thinking about what kind of barrier they want to build and the protection of Galveston, Houston. And they already joined the iStorm network because they want to learn now, before they decide what kind of barrier they're going to build, what the impact will be on the maintenance operations, not only costly, but also um, knowledge-wise. So I think that's pretty good development, learning in the early stages what the impact will be on maintenance and operations. And secondly, um, the role of Rijkswaterstaat would be an interesting one as well. Normally it's the companies going abroad and uh, you will hear some stories about it as well. But I think the Rijkswaterstaat organization, the waterboards, do have a specific knowledge that no one else has. Because the operation and the maintenance is something specialist. Because you can buy a build, you can, you can build a barrier, but how to maintain it is some interest not many people in the world do have. And uh, for example, uh, I told you I'm a leader of the operational team. I can imagine when, uh, when we closed in 2007, you're standing there and you know there's a big storm hitting the Netherlands, trucks are falling apart, uh, tunnels uh, uh, will be shut or closed due to the storm. And everybody uh, is doing its own thing during that storm, but we're sitting there as a team to be sure that the, that the barrier will be closed. And it can be necessary that even, on, for example, the Maesland barrier, we have to send people in, do, through the storm into the retaining wall, going downstairs to push buttons to be sure that we will be sure that the Netherlands will be safe. Um, and that knowledge about how that works is a scarcity in knowledge field as well. And therefore, I think it's pretty interesting for the future. And that comes up to you as well. New people, young people that have the decision what to learn, decide to learn next couple of years. Um, and we do have, I think, three parties in the Netherlands that are pretty important within our own country, but also for the possibilities abroad. It's the knowledge institutes that have a specific part of knowledge. It's the consulting companies and it's the government who is responsible for operating and maintaining those structures. And when those three, those three parts, the three type of organizations are able to co cooperate effectively, then I think as the Netherlands, we would be safer. And secondly, we would be able to share our knowledge worldwide and all those deltas where they have to buy and build new barriers. Um, so it means that there is a lot of value in technical uh, studies. There's a lot of value in specialism as management and operations and maintenance. But this also asks something for you in a way you cooperate with colleagues internationally and to find each other and to be strong together. So I would say uh, the greetings from my storm to you all. This is a picture we took in 2012. We had a conference in Rotterdam. Our uh, director general is in the front uh, waving to you. But I would say 
also inviting you um, to dare to challenge, um, learn the technical parts and technical studies and being of influence for the Netherlands um, to have the new step and to be able to set a new step in knowledge management, sharing our knowledge worldwide and make from the Netherlands a safer place. I would thank you very much. Um, I hope this gives you some information about the, the iStorm network and the value of maintenance and operations. If you would like to have some more information, it's on the internet side as well. Um, I will be here for the lunch today as well. So if you would have specific questions, don't hesitate uh, during lunch to ask them. And I don't know if there's a possibility to ask questions now or, yeah?